my name is John. I guess I'm kind of middle-aged and middle class and kind of male and stuff, so probably all the things you don't expect to be here. <laughs> and um, people who look like me, mostly people who look like me, um, pretty much created most of the problems that I'm about to talk about. So <laughs> I'm part of that shared guilt. And I'm also, I guess, um, I've run my own business for the last, whatever, 20-something years. I was, got started in my teens, don't worry. Um, you know, so I suppose I've kind of looked at the system from both sides. For me, as an individual, this system has been fantastic. It has given me all the opportunities, the good life, whatever you're having yourself, okay? However, there's a catch, and the catch is that the same system that has given people who look like me all the good things, all the opportunities, all the advantages, that same system is also going to kill us all. No exaggeration, it's going to kill us all. That system, continuing on its current trajectory, it's not going to work. It's simply not going to work for humans. So, however, it is a bit of a paradox. I'm going to start with this headline. This is very low tech. This headline from the New York Times, right? It's, I think it's great. It says, why 2018 was the best year in human history uh, by a guy who looks like me. <laughs> it says, once again, the world's population was living longer and living better than ever before. And in a sense, for guys who look like me, this is true. But there's plenty of other people for whom 2018 wasn't so great, or 2017, and indeed 2019. And this is just, by the way, within the one species on Earth that is actually doing great. The other millions of species, not so good. So, as I say, these guys, very good. These guys, not so good. I think it's very important to say that this, while this crisis affects us all, the causes are very unequally distributed. And certain type of people, mostly people who look like me, we have contributed disproportionately. And also, we're the ones, by and large, who are resisting change furiously and re resisting response to this furiously. So, anyway, I guess that's, that's sort of that part of it. A um, couple of headlines here, I guess you'd be familiar with some of them. The first one you can probably see fairly well. It's called The Insect Apocalypse Is Here. Um, this doesn't mean they're taking over. <laughs> Just to be clear, insects, arthropods, are very hardy. They've survived everything that nature has thrown at them for hundreds of millions of years. In fact, you really, really want to get to an earth-crushing level event before insects start to disappear en masse. Insects are disappearing en masse all over the world. This is probably, to my mind, if a greater red letter warning than any polar bear balancing on a piece of ice. These are the charismatic creatures that you tend to associate with climate breakdown. But the reality is, these guys hold the whole system together. And if they're in crisis, the system's in crisis. And the headline above it, it says, farming under threat as soil fertility falls 40% in 10 years. Now, Ask yourself, how can something fall 40% in 10 years? And then I cast my mind back to the year that I started in primary school. We take that year as a baseline, and we take 2020. We take that, that, those two points, okay? Between those two points, the total number of wild, land-based animals in the world has declined from the year I started in primary school to basically next year, if you take that as a measuring unit, by somewhere between 60 and 66 percent. So two-thirds of all the wild animals in the world gone in my lifetime, or a portion of my lifetime. Now, that begs the question, I've got two teenagers, so what's left for them? And I know that sounds kind of selfish and a bit whiny on my part, but maybe that's probably what brought me to focus on this in the first place, because as soon as you, know, you start seeing it through your kids' eyes, and next thing you're looking out into 2030, 2040, 2050, and suddenly, while it might feel good to say, well, this is not my problem, it most assuredly is their problem. 
I had a conversation recently with a, an academic from, from one of the universities who wanted to, well, we talked about a number of things, including grief around this issue. And she made a really interesting point, which I, I don't think I've actually said out loud since. She's, she's a bit younger than me, but anyway, she said she finds herself walking down the street, looking at faces as they go past. And she said she, her eyes kind of light on old people. And she said, I envy them. Extraordinary thing. And I actually know exactly what she means. The people, the last generation to die in their beds, surrounded by their families, with the health system propping them up. Unfortunately, that's a luxury that is disappearing. And anyone in this room under the age of 40? Anyone in? Hang on, let me check. Oh, shit. <laughs> okay. Anyone in this room under the age of 40? even under the age of 50. Unfortunately, this is the reality that we all have to contend with. So, now, um, I'll continue if I may. Now, two headlines here. The first one is from June 24, 1988. And it says, scientists say the greenhouse effect is setting in. So that's about 30 years ago or so. That was part of a presentation to the US Congress at the time. So then we fast forward 30 years, and we have climate scientists are struggling to find the right words for very bad news. They told us we didn't listen. They told us we carried on. From 1988 to 2019, humans have released more emissions into the atmosphere than for the previous 10,000 years combined. This is when we're on notice that we're in the middle of an existential crisis, what do we do? We doubled down. Oh, and by the way, there's lots of innocent parties in this, but there's lots of guilty bastards too. For example, the fossil fuel industry. Since 2015, since the Paris Agreement has spent, between them, a billion dollars a year spreading lies and misinformation about the reality of climate change. And that's why so many people remain so confused about this issue. And something as a media person I find incredibly frustrating that we're, in the, we're up to here in this crisis that is going to kill billions of people <coughs> and exterminate millions of species. And we're still asking stupid questions like, well, maybe it's the sun, right? It isn't. We've got to move on past that. But even that we're still, like we're stuck in amber arguing about silly questions that we should have moved on past a long, long time ago. And that's a shame. But that didn't happen, and I emphasize that, that didn't happen by accident. So, this is the headline from the 30th of April, this is yesterday. Crowded out of existence, a million species at risk of extinction because of human activities. A million species. Now, somebody describes species the way to think about them, because of course they cover it's right across the natural kingdom. The way to think about them is the way you might think about the rivets on the wing of an airplane. There's loads of them. And lots of them actually aren't that terribly important, but some of them are really important. They keep the airplane up. The problem is, we don't really know which parts of the natural kingdom we can pulverize and flatten without one keystone species collapsing leading to an ecosystem collapse, leading to further collapse. We haven't a clue because I suppose we've been too busy doing what we do, which is consuming and expanding to even consider it. And to suggest, by the way, and I, this again is something that, that sort of strikes me as very odd, to suggest that there is any limits to our entitlements is met with indignation and fury. I'll give you an example. I wrote about this in the Irish Times a couple of months ago, and I put forward what I thought was a fairly neutral suggestion. And the suggestion was that we introduce, connected to your PPS number, in Ireland and across Europe and elsewhere, hopefully, in time, a system where everybody is allocated a ration of air miles. I suggested 1,500 kilometers a year. That's it, okay? You get that at the normal price. And after that and above that, you get absolutely hammered. Well, that was fair enough. So I went on to a radio program to talk about it. And the host said to me afterwards, he said, the, most, the, the, the theme he said that came through more than any other theme in the texts and the phone calls that came into the show was, they'd like to chop your ghoulies off, <laughs> right? Because 
How dare that guy off the radio say that I can't do exactly as I please? How dare he set a limit to me? Problem is, we're operating inside a world where the limits are pressing down upon us all the time. And it's only really round about now that we've started to figure out that we're operating inside a set of incredibly finite and declining limits. Now, the more stuff that we continue to tear through over the next three, five, ten years is the less stuff that will be available for all humans and other species for the next thousand or ten thousand years. We have an incredibly finite space that we're operating within. You know those James Bond movies where the guy gets caught in the room where the two walls are starting to squeeze in? You know, there's always elaborate ways of killing people in a Bond movie. And we're kind of finding ourselves in, a, in an operating space for humans that is getting smaller and smaller. We've already pushed many fellow species to the edge, and many of them will disappear. There's absolutely no question about that. And the consequences of them disappearing are really hard to measure. So I saw in the opening clip, which is very inspiring, um, and actually one of the English newspapers put it really nicely. A little bit late, maybe 30 years late, who knows. But this is a great time, and I will put it this way. If you haven't started panicking about this issue yet, it's because you haven't grasped this issue yet. There is no calm, reasonable, methodical, rational way to get your head around the end of our species, the end of civilization. But that is where, that's what we're confronted with. Now, round about now, people start saying, whoa, 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 stall the digger. You've got to give people hope. Because if you don't give people hope, they get all sad and they go home and they say, oh, I feel listless and apathetic and I'm not going to do anything. So there, that guy made me feel sad. So now I'm not going to fix the world. So that will show them. We've tried hope. We've had 30 years of hope. And 30 years of hope has delivered a doubling of global emissions. Because hope has become hopium. It has become another product to sell. The technology is going to fix it. The Chinese, it's their fault. It's this, it's that, it's the other. It's everybody's fault. And somebody else. Anyway, the future will deal with itself. We've been programmed to be optimistic about the future. And by and large, especially for folks who look like us, in this part of the world, optimism has actually served us pretty well. But we've now found ourselves heading into an optimism trap because we have to confront ourselves with the reality that we have two roads ahead. One road is that we just continue to ignore the cranks and crackpots like me and steam on to near to midterm extinction. If I were a betting person, that's where I'd be putting my money. That's the most likely outcome of this, because we're dealing here with a lot of, I suppose, expectations, a lot of conditioning, and it's very difficult to turn that around. So the other option is, and I'm beginning to feel, and you'll have to bear with me on this, mild tinglings of optimism. Mild. Uh, they'll pass. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. <laughs> but the Extinction Rebellion is one of the first things I felt optimistic about in years. Greta Thunberg, I'm absolutely blown away. My own 16-year-old stood up on a rickety little step outside of Dáil Éireann in January and gave her first ever public speech. The kid wouldn't, you wouldn't hear her behind a sheet of paper. That's how motivated her generation are by people like Greta. And that gives me, don't tell anyone, a little bit of hope. That kind of change. But if you think hope means that we're going to come up with some, you know, cheap last minute fix to this that allows us all to continue our lives the way they've been, unfortunately, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. We've tried that, and that approach has got us to where we are now. How are we doing, Megan? Are we heading towards the gate? Okay. So, so I guess, finally, and in conclusion, 
many more best years in human history do you think we've got? Now, that's the question. That's what we have to think about. And there's a lot at stake. Actually, no. Everything's at stake. And yet, strangely enough for me, the death and destruction of the natural world, to my mind, is no less unbearable, no less agonizing than contemplating our demise. Because if we, as one species, through sheer greed and stupidity, couldn't evolve quickly enough to restrain ourselves to operate within a safe space, and if we, as one species among millions, end up completing the sixth extinction, then, you know, it's, I, don't get me wrong, I'm very fond of humans. Some of my best friends are humans. <laughs> but we suck, right? And we've got to stop sucking. We've got to be better humans. We've got to be the best humans there's ever been, certainly in recent times. And this is where I finish again with a, just a, a smidgen of optimism. We've got to be better. We've got to wake out of the trance of consumerism and the, the dream that has been dangled in front of us and look around. The natural world is dying under our feet. It's going to take us with it. We have to stand. We have to resist. And now is the time. And from that point of view, it's a very, very interesting time to be alive. Thank you. <laughs>